just an update to the virtual attendees. We're still working on getting the video set up to WebEx record. We have ran into a couple technical difficulties, so um, they are troubleshooting that at this point. As soon as that has been fixed, we will go ahead and start the meeting. Thank you for your patience. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Samantha Gambles Farr, chair of the Nurse Practitioner Advisory Committee. Um, the time is... 1245, we thank you for being so patient and I am calling this meeting to order. Um, as we have special circumstances as it relates to people who are here in person of the committee, um, it's nice to see everybody here in person. Um, and then uh, additionally, some of our members are remote. And so I'm asking that when we do roll call that you identify the location that you're in if you're not here present today. Um, first, we'll start with Dr. Edward Ray, Vice Chair. I'm here. Uh, I am. You said you want the address of where I'm located. Is that correct? Just the city, please. Oh, Los Angeles, California. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Andrea Espinoza. Andrea Espinoza. Thank you. Uh, NP Jan Johnson Griffin. Present. Thank you. Dr. Kevin Maxwell, nurse practitioner. Present. Do uh, Sally Pham, nurse practitioner. Present. Thank you. And Betha Schnell, public member. Present in Newport Beach, California. Were you guys able to hear that? Um, Thank you uh, and welcome to everyone. Happy Nurses Week uh, this week. Um, just wanna extend that as well. And we have established a quorum for the meeting. Um, we are now moving on to agenda item 2.0, general instructions for the format of the teleconference meeting. Um, I will have the moderator provide those instructions. Thank you. Good afternoon, this is the BRN moderator. I will be moderating the meeting. To facilitate public comment, we will be utilizing the WebEx question and answer feature. When the committee reaches a point in the agenda at which public comment is appropriate, the question and answer feature will be turned on and members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by inserting the phrase, I would like to make a comment in the question box, which is typically in the lower right of your screen. We will also ask our remote sites if they have people that would like to make a comment. I will then call on the individual and unmute their microphone. The individual will have two minutes to make their comments. I will not give a warning as your time approaches. I will mute your microphone and will announce that your time has exceeded the time allotted. I will then move on to the next member of the public who has a comment. Please note that the question and answer feature is being used only as a means for members of the public to represent that they would like to make a verbal comment. This is not a means to ask questions of the moderator or members of the committee. Such inquiries submitted using this feature will not be answered. When asking a question, please make sure the question is directed at the host, me, in the drop down. <clears throat> I will provide a brief reminder of this approach at the start of each public comment item. Finally, when committee members or senior staff are not speaking, I would like to remind them to mute their microphone. If I detect background noise during the meeting as a result of unmuted microphones, I will interject with a brief, brief friendly reminder. Thank you, moderator. We will now move on to um, agenda item 3.0, public comment for items not on the agenda um, and items for future agenda placement. Um, I will turn this over to the moderator for public comment. Thank you. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment.
committee chair gambles far there are no public requests in the webex are there any requests for comment there at hq no there aren't committee member edward ray in los angeles are there any public requests for comments in with you no there are not thank you committee member beth schnell in newport beach are there any public requests for comments with you no. Thank you. Committee Chair Gamble's far. There are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. Thank you, moderator. We are now on agenda item 4.0, review and vote on whether to approve the minutes from the previous meeting from uh, February 8th, 2022. Um, I'm calling for any correction, corrections or comments at this time from members of the committee. I have a correction. This is Andrea Espinosa. Um, so I'll let somebody go on because there was something that I did have corrected, but I. I'll defer right now. Thank you. Moderator, will you ask for other locations if there's any um, corrections as Dr. Espinoza finds her correction at this time? Committee member Edward Ray, are there any requests or I'm sorry, corrections? Nope. Thank you. Committee member Beth Schnell. Are there any corrections? Thank you. This is Andrea Espinosa. On page 16, uh, there's a, a correction on my, in my, on my review. It says, ask uh, for Andrea Espinosa. It says, uh, physicians take the NP certification. It was review. Uh, member, uh, Dr. Espinosa, can you give uh, which statement was it? Okay. Sorry. Uh, it's Andrea Espinosa. Uh, right after Tracy Montez, says Andrea Asset Positions take the MP certification as review. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Espinoza. As there were no additional comments, I'm asking for a call for a vote, please. Did we do a this public comment? Ray, I move oh, that we adopt the uh, minutes as, Thank you. <laughs> as amended. Uh, moderator, would you open the forum for public comments, please? There are no public comments here. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in the request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. We have no requests for public comment on the WebEx. We have no requests for public comment in HQ2. Committee member Edward Ray, are there any public requests for comment in Los Angeles? No, there are not. Thank you. 
committee member Betha Snell. Are there any public requests for comments in Newport Beach? No. Thank you. Committee Chair Gambles. Far there are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, moderator, please. Now that we've had opportunity for public comment, are there I will call for an app I'm calling for a vote or a someone to nominate for a vote, please. I motion to adopt the minutes as corrected. Second. Please identify yourself as you uh, put forth your motions, please. Sally Pham, a motion to adopt the minutes as corrected. Thank you. May I have Edward a second, Gray, please? Second. This is Andrea Espinosa. I second it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call for a vote. Um, Samantha Gambles Farr, yay. Dr. Edward Ray? Yes. Um, Dr. Andrea Espinoza? Yes. Uh, NP Jan Johnson Griffin? Yes. Dr. Kevin Maxwell, nurse practitioner? Yes. Nurse practitioner Sally Pham? Yes. Betha Schnell, public member? Yes. Okay. We will adopt the minutes with said reviewed um, correction from February 8, 2022. Um, moving on, agenda item 5.0, discussion and possible action regarding the draft regulatory language pertaining to the implementation of AB 890 um, as it further delineates in the agenda as uh, that was released earlier this in the last couple of weeks. Um, the information was sent out in addition to supplemental in your supplemental uh, materials uh, for your review prior to the meeting. Um, and we will start having a discussion at this moment in time. Can I make a comment? This is Edward Ray. Yes, please, Dr. Ray. Uh, I, I want to I want to thank the uh, BRN staff for uh, putting a lot of work into putting these regulations together. Um, I think they they had to listen to a lot of different voices throughout this process and. Uh, Appreciate that the work and effort they put into it, and um, I found that the regulatory language seems to reflect um, a lot of the suggestions that were made in a, in a fair manner. And um, I, anyway, just want to say uh, I, I agree with everything that's that's in there. There are some minor wording changes I would suggest, and I'm not sure if it's appropriate to bring that up now or not. Um, it's more or less just a phraseology point on the very last page. Um, of the regulatory language, which in the supplemental material is page 29, section 3C, which is in um, BPC section 2837.104. I'm sorry, I think it's 0 0.103. Section 3C reads any patient with acute decomposition or rare condition. I believe the word decomposition should be decompensation. So that's my only other comment. Uh, this is Reza. I, you said it should read acute decompensation. Yeah, decomposition is, uh, without sounding morbid, it's more like what happens to a body after somebody dies. Decompensation is what happens when someone medically deteriorates. What I'm seeing on page 29 reads decompensation. Oh. I mean, I just downloaded the supplemental material off the website, so maybe somebody already changed it on your end. As a, I am seeing what Dr. Ray is seeing. So under B, it says in acute comp decompensation of patient situation, but then further down under C, it says any patient with acute decomposition or rare condition. So it is, um, it has been transposed. And so it should be decompensation for both. Mm -hmm. And that is on page 29 of 30 of our meeting materials. Okay, I see that now. I was looking at subdivision C to B where it's correct. It looks like at C three, capital C is where the error is. So um, that's noted. And uh, I think that 
something that can be changed. We've got our regulatory council here as well um, who uh, will make note of that and let us know if that's a problem. And that was just the, the citation of the statute, so it's not actually in the regulatory text. Uh, Heather, did you say that? Oh, at, at HQ, we're having a little hard time hearing the folks that are elsewhere. Did you say that that's in statute? Sure, that's just the, the reprint of the statute in the supplemental materials. It's not in the actual regulatory text. Oh, uh, yeah, I see actually in section 2837.104, yeah, it does say any patient with acute decomposition or rare condition in the actual statutes. So we can't change that, that's statute, but all right. I thought that was somehow rewording of the uh, the language in the, in the regulation. So I guess, I guess you can just disregard that comment. So Dr. Ray, this is Lori, the executive officer. Mm -hmm. What I can do is let the legislative staff know of that error within the statute and I can try to get it changed through our sunset bill. They have asked for some of these minor corrections. Um, and so I will email this over to them and see if that update can be corrected. All right. I don't mean to be pedantic about it, but you know, I figure it is probably a little more precise word. <laughs> and just, just for clarification. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we've, we've clarified and I apologize for being slow to catch up, but uh, that, that was, um, just a copying of the statute on the AIS for item 6.0, just for reference. So um, that's not in the regulatory text at item 5.0. But it is a good catch, and uh, that would be great if Lori can uh, bring it up. This is Andrea Spinoza speaking. Uh, first of all, it's very hard to hear um, uh, the people that are not present here. I can't hear uh, one thing. I think it's hard for me to make some kind of uh, a decision or discussion when I can't hear. Is there something that can be given? I, I guess I will have to do what it, what it is right now, but I think in the future something needs to be improved with that because I really hear absolutely just mumble jumble. And I'm just asking uh, my doctor here next to me to help me with this, but you know it is confusing, and I think it's hard to to really evaluate these uh, regulations when we can't hear what the other um, speakers are saying. Uh, we could, uh, to the extent possible, our, our folks who are on WebEx and participating remotely, uh, maybe just try to speak as closely as you can to your microphone and speak up. I think here in person at the headquarters location, we do have some limitation though with the volume of the speakers and the proximity to our microphones due to feedback issues. So unfortunately, that may be something that they have to look into for next time. Um, And Dr. Espinoza, we also have uh, closed captioning on as well um, as best as it can be interpreted. Yeah, it's up on top. So thank you. I You're welcome. See that. Can I just say after reading through the regulatory language, it does seem to uh, reflect what we discussed and agreed to uh, at our previous meetings. Um, I agree with Dr. Ray that uh, uh, everything looks to be pretty ship shape. Um, I did have, uh, this is uh, Chair Gamblesfar. Um, I did have on one question as it relates to page 21 um, under section two, uh, Senate starts uh, under C, a registered nurse who's been certified by the board may use advanced practice registered nurse and or certified nurse practitioner. Um, I'm trying to remember if that was the language that we actually came up with or where the language certified nurse practitioner came from, and specifically the letters APRN dash CMP. 
So this is Heather Hergens on your regulatory council. The designation of the APRN CMP in the section that is re being relettered from B to C, that's actually existing regulation. Thank you for that clarification. Can I say something? This is Edward, Edward Ray. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, much better. Um, yeah, as I recall, I think we kind of tabled that whole discussion about terminology and, and we kind of left the, the language as it was in statute. Is that is that everybody else's understanding? That was the understanding that I had and that's why I specifically asked about subsection C here. As I see um, the letters clearly stated here, um, but I guess there's also room for it. Uh, or in coordination with other letters or words that may identify the category. And so I think that if if chosen to do so, any additional numeration or letters that need to go behind your name, um, if needed at all, will be after that fact, as we tabled that discussion, as you said, Dr. Ray. Any so this other is discussion Lori. from- This is Lori, the executive officer. Just for additional clarification, um, the board did vote that we would have no additional um, recognition of letters or numbers or anything after the name to delineate a 103 or a 104 NP. That is what was done. What Heather was saying is this language is already in our regulations. That is something that has been there for years and we are not changing, but because we are addressing this section that information is in this packet for reference. It is not something that you guys voted on. It's not something that has been created. Um, it is something that is currently there um, that is part of the section that you guys are updating. Thank you, E.O. Melby, for that clarification. Okay, um, hearing no, uh, I just wanna make sure I recognize um, if uh, public member Betha Schnell had anything uh, to contribute or say? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else have any additional comments? Yes, Dr. Espinoza. Yeah, this is uh, Andrea Espinoza speaking. Uh, on uh, page 22, uh, number 13, this may be part of the statutes already. I, I didn't get a chance to look at it specifically, but it looks like, it, if I'm understanding, it allows a 103 to sign off on um, the uh, nurse practitioner. And I'm not sh sure how that would happen. Did I understand that incorrectly? It says pr proof of completion of transition to practice submitting by submitting to the board one or more attestation of a physician a nurse practitioner practicing pursuant of uh, 2837-103. I, how can that happen if the 103 is still working? Uh, so we're allowing 103 to attest for transition to practice. Is that correct? That is correct. It would be a different 103, not the same 103. Correct. It would be a different nurse practitioner who is practicing as a 103 nurse practitioner signing off on a nurse practitioner who is wishing to become a 103. Okay. So you're, we're assuming that that 103 has been practicing. It's no longer. It's not an. She. The he or she is not a 104, but she works in a, a practice setting and she will sign up for transition to practice for somebody who's going to be starting that whole process. Am I correct? Given the description that you gave, that is correct. Okay. Any additional comments from members of the committee before we open it up to public comment? Okay, hearing none, moderator, will you please open each forum for a public comment, please? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. 
I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Dr. Cynthia Yovanov would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead. Dr. Yovanov, go ahead. Dr. Yovanov, are you able to speak? Mark, as you're assisting um, Dr. Cynthia Yovanov to be able to speak, I did want to give a quick update. I did reach out to legislative staff and they will be asking for an update to change that decomposition. So just to let you guys know that that has been asked and answered and it will be updated. Thank you, Dr. Ray, for catching that. Dr. Yovanov, are you able to unmute and speak? Okay, I will, I will come back to you. Alejandro Solis would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, Mr. Solis. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Hi, Alejandro Solis on behalf of Los Amigos de la Comunidad. Community groups. I'm sorry, community groups are reviewing the changes to the regulations and will provide feedback accordingly. Thank you very much for this opportunity to come. Thank you. Diane Tompkins would like to make a comment. One second, please. I just have one editorial comment, and um, it is on page 22, number 12, and I think it also reappears um, later on in the document where it talks about proof of holding a certification as a nurse practitioner. Um, one organization is the National Commission for Certifying Agency. The second one um, should be corrected to read the accreditation board for specialty nursing certification. The one listed is actually the membership organization and the accreditation board for specialty nursing certification is the accreditor for the certification. Thank you. Uh, this is Reza, can we have that person um, re repeat what it is, what you were suggesting it should be? Right, uh, I would, um, Delete American Board of Nursing Specialties and replace with Accreditation Board for Specialty Nursing Certification. That's the actual accreditor. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn Hendricks would like to make a comment. One second, please. Clarification. I'm sorry, this is Glenn Hendricks, uh, CAMP's um, Health Policy Co-Chair. Um, wanted the clarification on the attestation piece regarding, you know, nurse practitioners to another nurse practitioner. There, there is a comment about you cannot have familial or financial relationship. Can you clarify what that means?
Thank you. Heather, are you able to respond to that or um, is that not something that you're wishing? Um, so uh, briefly, I can say that we, we took that language from the rest of AB 890 um, in the early sections of the bill. They do talk about um, financial and uh, relationships and familial relationships. So is it to prevent um, possible bias in attesting to someone who, you know, your, your kid or whatever. So, so if I, um, in, in my work environment, if I have a, a, another colleague, say I'm the 103, who we will be attesting for this new um, person transition to practice. We have a working relationship. Does that um, qualify or is that, is that okay? So to speak. It's not designed to prevent uh, fellow employees, if that's what you mean. Um, if, right. if there's a financial relationship that is above and beyond that, that's, that's when there's concerns of bias. Okay. I still don't get a part of financial relationship though, but I'll kind of leave it there. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So this is Lori, the executive officer as part of the law that was passed with AB 890. There is a section in there at the very top of the bill. If you wanted to look it up, it is the 4th paragraph down and it says existing law makes it unlawful for specified healing art practitioners, including physicians and surgeons, psychologists and acupuncturists to refer a person for certain services, including laboratory, diagnostic nuclear medicine and physical therapy. If the physician and surgeon of their immediate family has a financial interest with the person or in the entity that receives the referral, a violation of these provisions is a misdemeanor and subject to specified civil penalties and disciplinary actions. That is also in section one of business profession code 650.01A. Additionally, it is defined in number three that talks for the purpose of this section. Immediate family includes the spouse and children of the licensee, the parents of the licensee, and the spouse of the children of the licensee. Under number two, it talks about what financial interest is, and it has a complete definition that is too lengthy for me to read here but it does include, but is not limited to any type of ownership, interest, debt, loan, lease, compensation, et cetera, et cetera. Then further down in 650.1, it continues to speak more. And then again, it follows that down. So if you wanted to go into ledge info, look at AB 890 and do a control find or a control F for family you will see the several sections that this is referred to, including the definition of financial interest and the definition of family that is referenced in this statute. Hopefully that helps. Very good. So my follow-up question to that is, you know, you have group practices and family businesses. So if a, a, a new nurse practitioner, you're pretty much saying that if they, if they work in a situation where they're, you know, transitioning to practice, it would not be a good idea to do it in a family business, correct? Again, this is Lori, the executive officer. I will have you refer back to the statute. That is the law that the bill was passed and they have clear definitions of what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. That is not being defined by the board of registered nursing that was defined in law. Um, and so we are following what the law has put forth for us. Uh, this is Reza, the, the board's legal counsel. I'll just add to that. So the, the portion that's in law that Lori referred to is in business professions code 650.01, uh, which she mentioned and um, the piece about financial interest is defined at 650.01 B2. 
that that statute talks about prohibiting referrals for laboratory diagnostic, et cetera. Um, we carried over the concept of uh, familial or financial interest into this piece about the attestation for the transition to practice in order to rule out somebody um, attesting to um, their their brother or sister or you know son or daughter's um, transition to practice, as Lori said, to or I think it was Heather, to um, eliminate those situations where somebody is just signing off for the sake of having that that interest, uh, so that we can have some credibility to these attestations that somebody's actually completed the transition to practice. So if I understood the question right, it was asking whether in a, um, a, a group practice where family members work together in that practice, um, it probably would be against the proposed regulation here to have one family member do an attestation on behalf of another family member. Um, hopefully I understood the question correctly. Yes, it, you, you understood me correctly. I, I'm just thinking that that is so, that can be so limiting because if you're in a situation, in a rural situation where that's the only practice that's there, the only group practice, you're pretty much limiting um, the, the, you know, the new grad to where they can work and actually get transitioned. I'm not sure if 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 this is a situation that we really want to get into. I can understand a portion about the labs and <clears throat> you know imaging studies and so on and so forth, but um, when it comes to TTP, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be so limiting for the nurse practitioner. It's not, it's not limiting for physicians because physicians work in their, you know, their fathers or mothers business or practices every single day. I don't see anyone putting it out there that they can't do that. Why would we want to do that to the nurse practitioner? So that that's uh, this is Reza again. That that's a policy issue for for this committee and for the board to decide. It you certainly the, the public commenter has a, a legitimate point. Um, there may be kind of family practices or practices where family members work together, and they would be limited given the current um, wording of the regulation. However, it's a trade-off. Um, the, the board needs some way of verifying that an NP who wants to work independently has done the transition to practice. And uh, again, you know, there's, there's trade-offs to everything. In order to strike a balance, we've um, developed this attestation, so it's not too intrusive, but it at the same time gives us something to rely on to point to um, them having fulfilled the statutory requirement of transition to practice. The I other trade-off is the, the, the kind of the, the credibility of that attestation. If, um, you know, and it's not to say that anyone who's making an attestation on behalf of a family member is necessarily lying about it or can't be trusted, but there certainly is, um, a lot of potential for bias and influence there where it, it causes the board to, you know, um, be able to place a lot less, um, you know, weight on, on the attestation. If we were to accept those types of attestations, you know, um, it, it would open the door at least for um, those types of situations. So. The, the point is, is well made and it, it's certainly a trade-off. Uh, it's just a, a policy decision that the, the committee and the board have, have thus far um, been, been going with. At this point, it's, you know, um, the committee can 
Well, well, Reza, you know, there are also nurse practitioners who have very good friends who own practices and whatever, and they can do that. Um, you know, I'm not sure this is a, a fair trade off to someone who you kind of pigeonhole them, um, in, in, you know, with this trade off. It's not supported. It is not. Physicians don't do it. Why are we doing this? I'm not sure what you're referring to with physicians or what the comparable analogous well, nobody situation said, would be. Well, what I'm saying is in the, in the part, with the part of the attestation, I understand that we have to do that. However, I, you know, I'm thinking where you have situation where, you know, uh, rotations are in short supply. Um, it, it might be a situation where the nurse practitioner has no other place to go within their geographical area other than working in their family business. And you're saying, well, you can spend three years there and be signed off on anyone in that business because they're related to you. Even though you're there working, you pass an exam. I don't, I don't understand. I think it's something that we, you really should go back, revisit and, and, you know, and change. Understood. Just yeah, like I think the, the point has been made. I think that, you know, um, again, like I said, it's, it's a fair concern. It's legitimate. Uh, and it's it's simply a matter of, of a trade-off. We don't want to preclude um, individuals in that situation from getting their attestations, but at the same time, uh, the board has had this concern in this committee about the, the veracity of the attestation that we get and whether, you know, there's any reason to... Well, I, I feel very offended because what you are sitting out there and saying is that these are a group of dishonest people and they can do dishonest things. And with this attestation, I don't think you should do that. Could be the same way with physicians, anyone. But if you're having someone working for three years, 4,600 hours, they can prove it even by payroll. I mean, you're saying they cannot be signed off? because they're related to their father who owns a practice? You're doing all of this, but at the end of the day, you're saying, well, we don't trust that you will be, you know, you're, you're giving us a fear at this station. I just think it's wrong. I don't think it's too far-fetched to, um... I mean, like I said, there are probably the vast majority, maybe nearly all, uh, would hopefully be honest in making the attestation despite, you know, the, having a family relationship or connection there. But I don't think it's far-fetched to um, think that there is a strong incentive for bias or just a kind of rubber stamp type of attestation that would happen between somebody who has a family relationship um, again, we, we we could allow it and hope for the best and hope that people are going to be honest, but at the end of the day, that's not, as regulators, what what we're supposed to do, just hope for the best. We, we have to implement common sense policies and, and balance the um, competing priorities, and, and that's so far where the board and the committee have landed. Um, I don't really have much more to, to say on that. I think, you know, if any committee members want to take up that Reza? issue further. Yeah, Reza, this is this is Edward Ray. Can I just comment? Um I think I think maybe to address the um the public concern here, is there any language that sets precedence for the I mean regulatory language either um within the board's jurisdiction or other boards that you're aware of that have similar restrictions? Um just you know, it would be helpful to see that so that this doesn't appear to be arbitrary. Um, and if we're not sure, maybe maybe we can add an agenda item in the future to kind of address this question later. But he did say it was arbitrary. 
they, you, you, you basically took one language that has to do with labs, X-ray, whatever, and move it over to attestation. I mean, how do you do that? Well, I, I mean, I think there are some legitimate concerns about financial relationships. I'm not, I'm not sure about the, you know, being a blood relative of somebody necessarily. Exactly. By somebody from being, being um, objective, but, you know, I definitely could see concerns about, um, you know, a potential applicant paying somebody to evaluate them, quote unquote, and having some kind of a financial relationship there that might not be objective. But this sounds like if there's a concern, I don't, I mean. I don't know if other board members have thoughts on this, or I mean, other uh, committee members have thoughts on this, but certainly be open to having a larger discussion at a at a future agenda item. Dr. Espinoza. Yeah, this is uh, Dr. Espinoza uh, speaking, and the other direction we could take is the opposite. Maybe we need to be more stringent on that and being. Uh, to say that I know that when the medical board will put down, like if they want, um, uh, if a doctor is in, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, oh gosh, uh, say they're in jeopardy of losing their license and they, they want somebody or another physician to proctor them or to review uh, their practice, blah, blah, blah. They sent us a letter saying, do you have these relationships at all? And it includes family relationships. Have you spent more than, uh, have you gone on a trip together? Have you, I mean, it goes to that much detail. And if you do, you can't, you can't be uh, 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 attesting to their, uh, their medical records or whatever. So we could look at it from that direction and have a very specific, and I agree with Dr. Edwards, Maybe uh, we or Dr. Ray, excuse me, uh, that we look at this further, but I don't think I would go to the other direction of saying family's okay. I would say we would have, if anything, would exclude family even more, but it would exclude people that are best friends. Like he was saying, how come you can allow a best friend to attest? Uh, uh, could be his godfather for all we know. So the the. So then the attestation becomes more uh, specific as to what's your relationship with this person that you're going to sign up. So, but I think that's a, 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 for another discussion. That's it. But attestation is not new. We, we have been doing it with furnishing. I mean, six months, when I, when I became a nurse practitioner, six months working with a physician, um, they signed off on it. I was able to get my DEA number. I mean, you know, so I didn't hear any hoopla or familiar relationship or, or financial relationship over it. So if you can trust me then, you know, why is it that you wouldn't want to do that now? Why is it that we're doing all this restriction? We, we, we are doing attestation or we used to do it until the law says, no, we didn't, we don't have to anymore. But remember, we used to do it for DEA license. You didn't hear anybody comment about it. So I'm not sure why are we even wanting more restrictions over this. This is three years, 4,600 hours. How do you fake that? Dr. Maxwell? Um, just on page 22, reading uh, the paragraph, uh, chapter 13. Um, I really don't see anything that states that the person that attests needs to have worked with you. It just says that you have to be in the same specialty area or category. So there's nothing to preclude someone from outside the practice coming in and attesting uh, the way I'm reading this. Yes, uh, Jan Griffin. I, I think it's important to remember that when we discussed all of this, everything that we discussed was much more restrictive. Uh, I mean, I remember specifically discussing providing uh, pay stubs 
as a way of proving that the hours had been achieved. Uh, the idea is not to be more restrictive, but this has to be a credible document. And I don't see that we have come up with anything that is, uh, that our suggestions, what's been written here, does anything other than create a verifiable, credible document. So thank you. I agree. Um, the purpose overall language of the bill is not to be more restrictive for the practice of nurse practitioners. Although that being said, there are precedences that have been set within the BRN and business and profession codes where this language is completely appropriate. Um, and as Dr. Maxwell had previously stated, um, there's not anything specifically written that precludes someone else who you don't specifically work with for attestation for your um, transition to uh, scope, your transition hours that you are needed. Um, that's pretty much it. So am I to understand uh, that as, as Dr. had mentioned that there is not, they don't have, for the transition of practice, it's not required that that person has worked with you or knows of your work. This is Sally Pham. I think the person has to be in your specialty, so that would imply that that person would know your practice. Um, I don't think they have to be present every day you know, at your work site, but they definitely should know your work. Okay. Moderator, do we, ha I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, it, it, because there's the, the financial relationship, so I think the worry would be that someone would hire themselves out to attest for people um, but having a financial relationship would preclude that. Um, but, you know, in a sense where there's someone who has no other nurse practitioner in that specialty uh, within a certain geographical area that's able to attest uh, that's not a family member, um, I just don't know how frequently that situation uh, exists uh, and if we need to change uh, regulation uh, in order to accommodate that. I guess it would be, you know, how big is this problem would be my question. Jan Griffin, uh, I haven't heard of an appeals process that being put in place. Is, uh, does anyone know if there's a precedent for that? Sorry, an appeals process for for the attestation form that if you have a special circumstance of some sort that there could be a avenue for which you could pursue that exemption or exception. Uh, it's not addressed in the draft regulation, but I think, um, and Lori will hopefully jump in if I'm um, misstating something, but ordinarily with for example, the normal licensing process and the application process, um, there's communication between the board and the applicant. So if an applicant submits an application and say the board, the board is required to identify deficiencies in the application, the applicant can always, um, you know, they have a point of contact with the board to either address the deficiencies or engage in um, communication to um, say explain why there really isn't a deficiency um, or, or, or get that sorted out. So I would imagine a similar type of thing here where um, and Reza if, if I could jump in as well if a, a certification was going to be denied the normal course of things would be a, you know a statement of issues and it it could go before an administrative law judge. So if there was 
if it got you know to that point i think it would be handled there and and an administrative law judge would be able to take a look at it any other comments uh, regarding this issue Uh, moderator, are there any additional comments? There are. Thank you. Dr. Cynthia Yovanov would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, Dr. Yovanov. This time? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Um, I actually... Um, did have a comment in regards to this. Um, I think that, um, you know, I agree with um, with Glenn that this does show bias to the nurse practitioners because in previous attestation, we never had this issue. Um, and this just shows another point of reference of obstruction. Um, I think that um, the whole point and the intent of adding this is to prevent like a uh, kickback um, I think that in order to sum it all up, I would recommend that the board uh, looks into adding the reference of the BNP 650.01 that Loretta Mebley, Mel Melby had suggested because it is long and injurious. Um, and so I, I would add my comment to that. But in regards to the, um, in regards to my second comment that kind of led into this conversation was on page 25 um, under the reference of the 104 section B under 15 section B there is a sentence there that I'm not sure when this got added in uh, and I've attended quite a few of the meetings um, I have a concern because the reference is the last sentence, if the written plan calls for a referral to a specific individual plan, um, the, the plan must include the individual's acknowledgement and consent to the referral signed and dated by the physician and the applicant. Um, that is impossible. And frankly, uh, referrals occur based on the patient's insurance, um, not on necessarily the patient's preference unless they are cash paying or they have a PPO. However, I would recommend that this sentence be completely removed. And as far as I know, this was not in the original language of AB 890. Um, and so this brings up a concern in regards to a referral and having some kind of authorization by a physician. We are not going to refer to a specific physician unless it is required by the insurance and on the outpatient side, if anybody practices on the outpatient side, it's a nightmare and it's all based on authorizations and referrals based on their insurance. Um, so I just kind of wanted to point this out because this sent last sentence is completely irrelevant to the intent of the original writing of the bill. And I don't know when that got sneaked in um, because that will be impossible to achieve uh, based on the patient's insurance. Thank you. Thank you. Scott RN would like to make a comment. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, if, if I could let the committee know, um, there was a, a specific request for language like this so that a physician was not caught unaware that they were listed on a referral plan. If there isn't a specific physician referred to in the referral plan, then that section wouldn't, that sentence wouldn't apply. Um, but, but we have had a couple of different requests and I think it was in the letters that was provided, to, that were provided to in the supplemental materials, either this time or the last time in February. Um, but there was just a concern that, that someone would have a patient show up and say, oh, I'm, I'm being referred to you, and they wouldn't have any idea about that. Okay, sorry, Scott RN would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead. 
Uh, just maybe one final comment on the issue of signing the attestation form. Um, I think maybe what's being missed is a nurse practitioner would want this to be in place if there's ever any question about his or her competence, competence, competency um, in court or in any kind of investigation by the board. You would want to say, look, I took a, uh, uh, an exam that was a, a uh, an exam that's accepted and I would want my attestation form signed by somebody that you can't poke holes at. You can't say, well, this was your dad or this was somebody that owed you money and who's to say you didn't forgive the loan for them signing your form. You would want it signed by someone who's not attached and the only reason they would sign it would be their commitment to the high quality nurse practitioner practice. So it's for the it's for the protection of that individual nurse practitioner as well. I understand there could be some complications in some rural areas, but I think it's important to consider that aspect as well. Thank you. Thank you. Committee Chair Gamble Spar, Dr. Yovanov would like to make a comment to Heather's comment statement. With, is that okay? Are there any other comments um, at other sites prior to her making her second comment? Sorry, are there any comments there in HQ? There are no HQ. comments, public comments here. Sorry, Committee Chair Edward Ray, are there any public requests for comments in Los Angeles? No, there are not. Committee uh, committee member Beth Schnell, are there any uh, public requests for comments in Newport Beach? No. Okay. Committee Chair Gamble's far, there are no pub other public requests for comments anywhere else. Um, could you like yes, to? Yes, please. Apologize. We can have a second sorry. comment. Sorry, Doctor Doctor Yovanov. Uh oh. Hi, thank you, for, you yeah, thank you for allowing me to respond. So um, I, I just want to respond back that what you just said was that there were people concerned, of course, opposition, about having referrals sent without their acknowledgement. Okay, in the real world, it does not exist. Patients are referred based on their insurance plan. And there is no way we are going to be able to say, hey, Dr. So-and-so, we have a patient we're gonna to refer to. I need you to sign this form um, and date that I am actually referring a patient. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm finding these slide-ins very one-sided and this does not help drive patient care one bit. So I am going to ask kindly that the board who actually practices in primary care and has to jump through hoops and fires of insurance companies trying to get patients where they need to go, that they look at this sentence and strike it out because we do not practice on a physician's license. And there is a huge misconception that we are going to, you know, be sideswipe or, or we're sending them a patient they're not aware of. You know, I just want to put out there that there's a lot of physicians that don't even take Medi-Cal and with intent, they opt out of taking Medi-Cal patients, which is a form of financial discrimination. So please look at this sentence reconsider it and strike it out because it is going to be impossible if I am a 104 and I need to send a patient to a specialist that I'm going to have to get a hold of them, their office, and get something signed and dated by the physician prior to them accepting the patient. And if that's the case, I'd be more concerned of the physician who has to approve a patient to that they're gonna see based on possibly the complexity or even the insurance. So I am asking that the board again, looks at this and strikes the sentence out and not be biased by one group. Thank you. Can I make a comment? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ray. I saw your hand up, but I was gonna make sure you were noted. So in, in response to Dr. Jovanov's comment, um, I, I, I think we should just clarify that the language there refers to a written plan that's actually required 
in statute to be in place. So eliminate the sentence. I'm sorry. Eliminate, sorry. This, eliminate the sentence. You're right. You're absolutely eliminate. right. It, it, there is a right. Dr. Not... Jovanoff, can you please allow Dr. Ray to speak and sure. finish his statement before you interrupt again? Thank you. So sure. yeah, the way the way the sentence reads, it's it's actually adding to that paragraph, which is actually a requirement in in statute to have a written plan, and all it clarifies is that the physician that has to be referred to in the plan that's already in the statute should be notified ahead of time. That's all it says. So if you have different physicians who have different insurance plans, you know, when you come up with a written plan, select one from each insurance carrier if you have to. But I think the idea is that they have to be notified ahead of time that they're in the plan. If someone's referring to a physician and they're not aware that they're going to be getting these referrals, they may there, there may be some conflict there. I'm not sure that there would be, but I think that was the intent for the way that was written, that they should be notified if they're going to be included in somebody's plan that they're submitting to the BRN. Um, so I I don't think it adds that much of a you know an arduous sort of hurdle to to practitioners um, who have to come up with a written plan anyway. So. The intent, you know, the way the bill's written, you're absolutely right that a plan should be in place. You're absolutely right. But in the bill, it does not say that a signed and dated, that it must be signed and dated by the physician and the applicant. So we are essentially going back to collaborative agreement without the word collaborative agreement. That was not in the bill. And so, Dr. Ray, I don't know if you take you know, patients that have Medi-Cal, Medi you know, Medi-Cal patients. I'm not sure if you do. I do. But there's no way that we are going to refer to one specific physician. There's no way. We're never going to do that. We refer to the patient needs. So they may need the ophthalmologist. They may need the dermatologist. They may need the surgeon. So how are we going to obtain that? this essentially is saying a collaborative agreement without the written word collaborative agreement and that last sentence is not in the bill signed and dated by the physician and the applicant that's not there we do that now we have a collaborative agreement so the whole point is to remove that yes we should have a policy and a plan in place but we do not have to have in the bill, it did not state we needed the sign and dated by the physician. That's my whole point. So I think the I think the written referral plan though is in cases of patient uh, decompensation, not just routine to, referrals. Dr. Ray, we send them to the ER. That's what we do. You know that that nurse practitioners do that in primary care. We're not going to send it to another primary care physician and say, "Oh, our patients decompensated." That's we're not going to do that. We're going to send the patient, we're going to make a phone call to the ER, and we're going to say, hey, I have a patient who may be having an MI. I need to send them to you now. There, and there, we know that. We've been practicing in primary care for so long. you know. And so all you're trying to say is that we don't recognize those signs and, oh, we better have a physician sign a piece of paper because we don't want NPs referring to another primary or another you know, specialist without us being notified at, at first. I may want to refer to you, Dr. Ray, and I may not be able to because my patient can't go to you because you may not accept a certain insurance. So all I'm saying is that that last sentence be removed. Essentially that we have to have a signed and dated agreement essentially with the physician and the applicant. We went through this nightmare for two years to remove that and somebody slid this in. So I am asking to remove that because that is not what's in the bill. So point of clarification, uh, Dr. Cynthia, I'm so sorry, I just butchered your name. I apologize, I can usually say it really well. Um, when it says, if the written plan calls for a referral to a specific individual, um, then that is where you're having the um, opposition for the signed and dated. Is it feasible that if the plan does not refer to a specific individual that a signed and dated agreement is not needed? Or 
is there something specific with the if the written plan calls for a referral to a specific individual that is bothersome to you? Because the way that I'm reading it, and I could be completely wrong with this, is if I have a plan and it doesn't refer to a specific individual, I don't have to have a signed and dated plan with another physician. If my plan says I'm going to refer to the ER for acute, acute decompensation um, at you know Sutter Healthcare, then I don't have to have it signed and dated. But if I specifically state that I'm going to refer to Dr. Ray, then Dr. Ray needs to sign it because he should know that I'm sending my patients who decompensate directly to him. Um, so I'm, I'm really trying to kind of clarify so that we can take this into consideration and put it forth to our board, which is the specific area that you are opposed to so that we can get this further worked out. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Sarani Kwan would like to make a comment. One second, please. Ronnie Kwan. Good afternoon, everybody. So Ronnie Kwan um, from <clears throat> Mercy River Health Clinic, a nurse practitioner, also with Sutter Health. Um, I do I do want to back up what Cynthia Jovanov is saying. It's true that when we refer people, we don't have an option to select who we refer them to. It's entirely dependent on their insurance. I take care of underserved at a FQHC in Western Sonoma County. And I have a hard time having my patients uh, seen by anybody because most of them are um, uncovered or they're Medi-Cal. And I'm dictated by the Medi-Cal and um, also any other providers willing to see patients that don't have insurance that pay cash. So I, I find it confusing why we would have language like this in regs that essentially will inhibit and prevent access for nurse practitioners to deliver care to patients and patients to actually receive care from us. Thank you. Thank you. So again, this is Loretta Melby, the executive officer for the BRN. I just really need some help to understand that. Sarani, can you stay on and kind of answer a question? So I, is this reading where you believe that this is addressing insurance referrals? So, um, where a patient is seen by you, they hurt their ankle, they need to go to a surgeon for ankle surgery. So you put in a referral to the insurance company and, um, it goes to that doctor that is now an orthopedic specialist. that's going to operate on the ankle. Is that how you guys are reading this? And if so, would it assist if we were to clarify that a bit? Because what I think the understanding is with the way that the law is written is that they shall have a written protocol for consultation and a written plan for referrals. And that is in the statutory requirement. And so my interpretation of that, which could be incorrect and Reza can jump in at any point as well, is that you have some sort of plan that you turn in um, that says when a patient is experiencing acute decompensation, the nearest emergency room to my practice is five miles away and it's this location and I'm going to refer to them. And I have privileges at that hospital so I can have a continuity of care and see the patient there. I'm, I'm not reading it as um, this is specific to an individual um, physician or surgeon. Um, and for the referrals, it, it could say that I am contracted with Blue Cross Blue Shield and United Healthcare, 
And my written plan for referrals is I would contact my insurance agents. I would uh, make sure my contract is up to date with my insurance companies that I see um, people under these insurances and I would refer to my, ins my insurance company for referrals to where the patient is covered of some sort. And of course, I'm kind of speaking off the cuff right here. Um, so it's not as articulate as it should be, but I'm not seeing this as I am, uh, you know, nurse practitioner A, and I'm going to refer to uh, Dr. B. And unless that is what your plan dictates, and that would be the only time that a signature and a date would be required. So I, I think that we're taking a generalized statement that is within statute and making it very specific and getting pretty emotional about it because I know that you guys have been fighting to not have these collaborative agreements for many years. So if you guys can specifically tell us what specific language can be updated to make that more clear, I think that would be helpful for us to move this conversation forward. Would it be more valuable to um, talk offline instead of taking committee time to do this? Perhaps uh, Loretta, we could um, meet with you offline and then bring it back to this committee for discussion. Because I see what you're saying and I agree that makes sense. Uh, of course, I'm not necessarily gonna refer my patient to the closest ER to me because I have patients, for instance, during COVID had a patient move down south. So I was doing televisits with him on a monthly basis and I did have to send him to the ER. And I called the ER to say, hey, I'm sending you a patient. I don't have a relationship with that hospital and many of us in the ambulatory setting don't have privileges at hospitals any longer because most hospitals have hospitalist and intensivist services. So there's no reason for me to have privileges any longer. Yeah, that was, that was an example. Um, so as for meeting offline, that's absolutely something we can do, but I really want to put the um, complete transparency out here is. The NPAC committee will have to vote on this language today on whether to accept it to accept it with modifications or reject it. Um, and it is already slated this language to be presented to our board next week for vote and consideration to start the um, regulatory process um, and continue to move that forward. So it would um, behoove everybody to have the information here out in this public forum to be considered um, because the hope is that next week our board can move on this and we can continue to advance the regulations forward so that it can be implemented as quickly as possible, knowing that it does have to go through the regulatory process, 45 day comment period where people can request hearings, et cetera. So it's Sarani Kwan again. I, I think that I'll just close by saying my preference is that you make it uh, uh, as least restrictive as possible. And I find it unrealistic that an MT would uh, identify another provider to send a patient to if something were not going well. I mean, the patient needs to go to a higher level of care, probably emergency department. So it would be, in my opinion, um, in inappropriate for an MT to say, oh, just go see another whatever primary care doctor like Cynthia was mentioning or you know some other physician to manage your problems because I can't do it. That that just doesn't seem realistic or responsible in my opinion. Um I'm going to acknowledge uh MP Sally Pham. Um thank you. Um, so, you know, when I was reading this, maybe I was biased, but I think the referral meant like if a patient came to see us independently and that patient didn't want to see us anymore. And so then we need to, and, the, if they, and then they asked to see a physician, who would we send it to? Not because our patients are decompensated um, and we need to send the patients to the ER. I think maybe when I'm reading this, I may be biased. What does the committee think? Um, this is Samantha Gamblesfar. Um, I think you can read this sentence either way. I think that um, the first sentence specifically states that within 90 days, you're gonna have a 
plan in place as far as how you're gonna do referrals, but in speaking to the language of Dr. Jovanoff and uh, Ms. Kwan, the second sentence, if you already have that plan in place and depending on what insurances that you have, I think that you can, you can kind of read that second sentence one or two ways. I don't think that it's very transparent to me. Um, when I read it the first time, I didn't really see that much issue in it, but in, the, in this discussion, I do have pause for the fact that it does state that it has to be signed and dated by the physician and the applicant. So I, I don't, I'm thinking that that one sentence is being read multiple ways um, depending on who's reading it. And I think that we need to tie down the actual spirit of what that second sentence is meant for. Oh, and perhaps is... Reza can give us a better idea because this second sentence was was not present, I don't believe, the last discussion that we had. Uh, that's correct. This, this sentence was an addition, and I want to be upfront about that. It, it's, you know, there's been some kind of uh, insinuation that this was tried, you know, uh, slipped in there. That's not the case. It's in the materials. Its purpose was to discuss it and get public opinion on it, just like we're doing now. Um, so this is all how the process ought to play out. Um, there's nothing surreptitious or, or sneaky about it. Um, it was not previously in there. It was in response to concerns that were raised, and, and that's why we're, we're discussing it. Um, one thing I wanted to clarify, that the plan that's, that this is in response to, it's, it's not so much if a patient requests to see a physician instead of an NP. This is addressing the plan that's identified in Business Professions Code, Section 2837.104, Subdivision C3. Again, that's 2837.104, C3. And that says the nurse practitioner shall establish a plan for referral of complex medical cases and emergencies to a physician and surgeon or other appropriate healing arts providers. The nurse practitioner shall have an identified referral plan specific to the practice area that includes specific referral criteria. The referral plan shall address the following. A, whenever situations arise which go beyond the competence, scope of practice, or experience of the nurse practitioner. B, whenever patient conditions fail to respond to the management plan as anticipated. C, any patient with acute decomposition, is what it says now, or rare condition. D, any patient conditions that do not fit the commonly accepted diagnostic pattern for a disease or disorder. E, all emergency situations after initial stabilizing care has been started. So that's the plan of referral to physicians that this piece is addressing. And I wanna also um, come back to what Lori was saying that the way that the language of the proposed draft regulation reads, if your plan of referral to a physician is to refer patients to a specific individual physician or other healing arts provider, then you'll need to have a written plan signed by that other individual. On the other hand, if your plan is not to refer to a specific individual, but to refer to whomever insurance dictates or whatever else your plan may be, it doesn't require a signature. Now, I think um, we, we've discussed somewhat the, the kind of logic behind this, that a physician or other healing arts provider, if they are identified in a plan as somebody who's gonna be receiving your patients in the situation that goes beyond your competence or uh, emergency situations, probably fair and appropriate and in keeping with patient safety that that physician or healing arts provider know that that's your plan. Um, likewise, if I'm a patient and I'm seeing an NP who is practicing independently under section 104 um, and their plan is to refer my case in case of an emergency to a specific other individual, as a patient, I would probably wanna think that other, other individual knows that that's the case, that I'm going to them in case of an emergency. 
So, um, you know, the, the feedback is certainly welcome and, and valued, and, um, you know, if, if it's impossible to implement, then, of course, you know, that, that's something we need to hear and, and um, revise accordingly. But if, you know, I, I heard Dr. Ray say that this doesn't seem to be, you know, given the way it's currently worded, an, an insurmountable hurdle or, or some, some arduous, um, um, you know. Now, uh, can I elaborate on my, on my thought there? Uh, just, just to, because I think we're coming at this from different angles and I think it may be confusing as some of the, uh, the callers have um, pointed out. Um, I was looking at this more as if you are in a sort of a private practice and you have a patient, say kind of a general uh, internal medicine type of patient who shows up with an issue that you don't feel comfortable managing. And if you have an established um, habit of then referring those patients, say to an internist, an MD, then if you're always sending to the same person, you probably ought to ahead of time, let them know that you're gonna be referring them some of your more complex patients. Or if you manage, say a patient who has diabetes and it's a type of diabetes that's very refractory to insulin uh, and to all the normal medications that we use and you wanna refer them to an endocrinologist. I don't think you necessarily have to have in your plan the name of every endocrinologist in the city or in the town, but maybe just, you know, if you're only gonna be referring to one particular person for a given problem, then as a courtesy, you ought to include them in that plan. Does that, is that kind of jive with what everyone else is interpreting here? Is that Reza based on the legal language here is, or the regulatory language, does that seem to fit? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I think you were basically, and correct me if I'm wrong, kind of, kind of reiterating the point that if your plan doesn't call for a specific individual, you don't need that person's sign off or you don't need anyone's sign off because there's no specific person named. But if you've named, I'm gonna send it to Dr. X, um, that's when- That would be the one situation, I, yeah. Yeah, um, I think there's additional comment here. Before, I, I just wanted to kind of circle back to um, something Lori was saying earlier. This, is, this language is, is being presented for approval uh, by the committee and it will be presented in, to the board at the meeting on the 18th and 19th. And um, the goal of course is to have good regulatory language that everyone's reasonably comfortable with that we can move forwards with so that we can actually get the ball rolling on the formal regulatory process, which we haven't really, we haven't published our notice of, of regulatory action yet. Um, so that, that's a lengthy process as well. So um, the options are you can, if, if you accept the language as it's written, you can accept, you can vote to accept it and recommend that the board move forward with it. If there are specific changes to it, um, you can um, address that here and, and make that part of your motion and then that could be considered by the board on the 18th and 19th. Um, the hope I think is that by the time the upcoming board meeting is concluded, we have at least something that we can move forward with. Um, you know, after listening, um, I realized that I, I had a bias when I was reading this. Um, when, when we do call for signed and um, dated by the physician, uh, for the referral Pacific physicians. I, I worry that especially nurse practitioners um, out in the rural area, there might be just one other provider. Most internal, like most primary care physician is not gonna refer to another physician when their patients de decompensate. I think they do call for the urgent care or the emergency room. Um, so I, I think we should vote today in striking out that sign and dated by a physician and the applicant. I would just like to add that, um, you know, if you're a section 104 NP and you are writing your plan at all, if at all possible, never put anyone's name in it. 
um, refer to, you know, what if, what if they're referring to the name of uh, a group uh, or for whatever reason, just, you know, don't put someone's name in your plan because anytime that person moves on, you're going to have to write another plan uh, and, and get all that. So I think, I think if it, all of this can be fixed if you just don't do that. Jan yeah, Griffin, it, it does seem like what we're discussing here are really two different things. We're discussing the general requirement to have a written plan, A, and then this other issue, B, which I would call an individual care plan, and that's not what I understood this was about. This was supposed to be about the general plan of, you know, in a situation, this is what's going to happen in general, not in specific. Thank you. This is uh, committee member Gambles Farr. Um, overall, I think in hearing everybody's discussion, if, if most providers and MP providers are going to be writing plans specifically with group names and not individual names, um, I don't see the utility in having the second line at all particularly requiring a signature um, because if you are in a rural community, you will have hopefully someone that you can identify with anyway, and that would be part of your written plan because you would have perhaps limited resources or you would send someone to a larger facil facility and you would name that whole facility. So the utility of having this entire second line does not seem rational to me because of that. Um, Edward Ray. Um, I mean, uh, I think Dr. It, Ray, it, can you hold on one moment? I'm going to yield the floor to Dr. Espinoza and then we'll come to your comment. Yeah, this is Dr. Andrea Espinoza. Um, you know, I understand where this is coming from, but on the other hand, listening to uh, Ressa, I see the reasoning behind it. I think that um, I work in a rural community and, oh, take this off. Uh, I work in a rural community, and it is difficult at times to get referrals, um, and because there are very few of them. On the other hand, I think if I'm looking at this correctly, it's um, assurance that people, the patients, will be safe if there is a record of who's going to be the referral group. It, I, you know, I think that having at the very least, the list of who has agreed to be on that referral panel is a good thing. Um, I think that there's been situations where I have had difficulty getting a referral out. And uh, so I, I think that if I have a, a discussion with a physician and say, listen, I need to see if I can depend on you. And there's a collaboration because, you know, some. Uh, um, there are some patients that are very complex and and are more than what you would expect in a in a city. Certainly in the rural community, you don't have that quick access. And so having that conversation even on the phone with them for that collaboration makes a big difference. And I think the reassurance for our patients and the community that we have something like this in line that says, we have this patient, this doctor is going, is in our plan, blah, 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 or at least it's on. And of course the insurance dictates some of that, but that's okay because then you know you have somebody who's agreed. But if you don't have that, and in the rural community that, that can happen, you have that list. This is Dr. So-and-so, I've talked, he's in agreement. I'm talking to myself in a way or other doctors or other nurse practitioners. I have a, an agreement with this doctor and he's gonna to talk to me at least over the, uh, collaborate over the phone. That's reassurance that we have talked to him and it's not like, um, because there is going to be, uh, there, I think uh, Jan and I have talked about, there will be a difficulty at, at some point of having to getting referrals and, and doctors say, no, I'm not making, a, I'm not taking a referral. I think it's important that we establish that now and say, 
these are. I don't know if I have to have the signature at the very least that I had a discussion, you know, and say I've had a discussion and they're agreed. And you have a, a list of all the doctors you've, uh, that you've made agreements with, or not verbal agreements or collaboration agreements that say, yeah, you'll help me, blah, blah, blah. And, and to me, that would, would be uh, safest, safe for a patient. Um, uh, so I think that, I think I, I said what I needed to say. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ray? Yeah, I repeat a little bit of what the, what was just said, which is I think it, it actually helps both the patient and the nurse practitioner because then they have a list of people that they can reliably send patients to. And again, this would only be in situations where perhaps you're in a very isolated community and there's just not many people around. So you identify perhaps an internist or some other specialist that you will commonly send patients to. But I agree also um, uh, with what our chair said about, you know, if you're not going to be naming names, it really, it may seem irrelevant to you, but it shouldn't hurt either having that language in the, in the regulation. Um, because there may be situations where it makes sense. And I think it is kind of a courtesy. If you're going to be sending a lot of patients to one doctor, it, it would be nice for them to know and agree ahead of time. So there's no conflict and, and the patient doesn't adversely um, get stuck in the middle without having anyone to go see. Uh, Beer and moderator, are there any additional public comments? Patty Gurney would like to make a comment. One second, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity, Patty Gurney, uh, pediatric nurse practitioner. Um, president of CANP, I want to reiterate um, points made by our uh, previous um, nurse practitioners regarding this requirement. Basically, what you're doing, if you um, keep this, this sentence here, is putting in a requirement for a collaborative agreement, which completely negates the purpose of having a 104 MP. Um, it would, it's, it would uh, put into regulation a very untenable and um, difficult to implement uh, practice. That first thing, if the intent is specifically, as some of the panelists have said, to notify a physician who's named in um, the previous agreement that we're talking about, uh, or the previous plan um, that the 104 has in place, then that needs to be stated. If, the, it, it just to add, if a physician is named in the plan, then, um, otherwise, this could be um, open to misinterpretation um, by those who would say, well, um, look, in the regulations, it says you have to have a written agreement that's signed by a physician. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> um, committee Chair Sarani Kwan has requested to make a comment again. Um, moderator, as the time is now 2.24, um, I'm going to um, ask that the public comments stop at this time so that we can have additional discussion. I don't know if we're able, if I'm allowed to do that. Okay. Okay. Um, I do want to let, um, was it um, Ms. Sarani Kwan that wanted to ask another question? Yes. That she can... Um, send her question or her comment to impact at dca.ca.gov so that um, any additional questions or anything that she has can be addressed at that time. But for the sake of time, um, uh, we can't, I can't, the committee should not hear second comments at this time. Okay. Then, um... We have no other public requests for comments on the WebEx or in any one of the remote areas or there at HQ, I'm assuming, yes? There aren't any public comments here. Thank you, okay. Then would you like me to close this window? Yes, please.
Okay. Um, at this time, I'm asking if there's any a call for um, any votes or action on uh, agenda item 5.0. Yes. This is Andrea Spinoza. Can I make a motion? Yes, please. Okay. I, I, my motion is that on uh, 15B that we change that sentence uh, to uh, the written uh, a written plan calls for a referral to if a written plan calls for a specific uh, individual, the plan should include the physician's acknowledgement and consent to the refer to uh, referrals with an S, referrals, and, uh, and period, and leave out signed and dated by the physician applicant. So this allows that there is a list and a, 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 you, uh, the nurse practitioner has uh, uh, and a physician have acknowledged a relationship there of referrals. And, and it's understood by having that list there and, and uh, eliminates the idea of, does that mean I have to sign a date every time I have to make a referral? That's my motion. Do I have a second? Uh, Jan Griffin, I'll second. We'll call for a vote at this time. Um, Dr. Edward Way. Yes. Are we, wait, can I just say one thing? Are we adopting all the other regulatory language as well, or are we just voting no, and changing this the sentence? Is, this is specifically as it relates to number 15 under section B, removing the signed and dated that by that physician and the applicant, that portion of that statement will be removed under this motion. And it's under 1482.4. Subdivision B, which comes after subdivision A15. Thank you. So we can vote on individual language within the proposed regulation. Okay. All right. Then I vote yes. Okay. Uh, NP Jan Johnson Griffin. Yes. Dr. Kevin Maxwell. Yes. NP Sally Pham. Yes. Betha Schnell, public member? Yes. Samantha Gambles Farr? Yes. Motion carries to remove signed and dated by that physician and the applicant. But it has says, been removed. Where it says individual, where it says individual, uh, it should specify physician. Or should I say, or, or should I leave it at individual in case it's somebody else? Right? That was the motion that I understood. All right. That's fine. Yeah, because it can be a non-physician healing arts provider. Yes. Uh, any other additional call show. for action? For clarification, are we also going to be uh, getting a motion or a vote on accepting the regulatory package? Um, uh, the that is the, the call for rate that I was calling for at this point in time, okay. E.O. Melby. Yeah, this is Ed oh, Ray. I'd I'm like sorry. To, would you like to make a motion? Yes, Dr. Ray. Uh, I move to accept the uh, remainder of the regulatory language as presented today. Do I have a second, please? I okay. second. Jan yeah, Griffin. <laughs> Thank you. Call for vote. Um, Gambles for aye. Dr. Ray? Yes. Uh, Dr. Andrea Espinoza? Aye. Uh, NP Jan Johnson Griffin? Yes. Dr. Kevin Maxwell, NP? Yes. Sally Pham, nurse practitioner? Yes. Uh, Betha Schnell, public member? Yes. And uh, the regulatory language has passed with the previous uh, motion in place uh, to correct subsection um, 14.8. 2.4 under 15 with B. Correction. Did I say that right? Okay. 1482.4 uh, B. Thank you for the correction. Okay, moving on. Uh, we have, let's see what time it is. It is now 2.30. Um, we are scheduled to complete the meeting at 2.30.
that would mean that we would need to table agenda item 6.0 um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to ask if members of the committee can go late um, and put a time limit on the discussion um, as we started approximately 15 minutes late. Is everybody okay with staying 15 minutes later? Uh, I'm going to ask. Uh, I unfortunately cannot because I am in a public location library where my room is rented until 2.30. So you can feel free to proceed without me, but I can't stay. Yeah. Well, then, um, because one of the committee members does not have access to at the time. Right, right. So I'm being told that because the location won't be open to the public, um, where our public member, Betha Schnell, is, we will have to stop the meeting and we'll have to table agenda item 6.0 for our next meeting. Okay, well, thank you guys all for um, attending. Um, I'm sorry? Yes. <laughs> thank you all for attending. Um, once again, happy Nurses Week. Thank you for the input from our public members and for all of the members of our committee and for the members of the BRN and staff for all their hard work and all that you do. The time is now 2.32. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Nurses Week.